do 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 Good day. Hello. Welcome to the JB Font channel. I am your host, James Fauntleroy. It's so good to see all of you here on today for a reading. The JB Font channel is also available on all major podcast platforms like Anchor, Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, so you can subscribe to me there. I'm also part of the Revolutionary Blackout Network, so you can find me on the JB Show on Sundays at 1 on RBN Live on Tuesdays at 4, and the Savvy and JB Show on Thursdays at 6. If you are new to the channel, please make sure to give us a thumbs up, and thank you to all the patrons on Patreon, Coffee, also to all the members and the people who send me mutual avias via various platforms, for without you guys, I would not be able to do this. So... Dirty Truths, Michael Parenti, we're back again, and we're going to be reading, uh, starting on page 192, um, and this one is called The Wonderful Life and Strange Death of Walter Ruther. So this is talking about Walter Ruther. And so this is going to be interesting. It says co-authored with Peggy Nutton. Uh, and it has a, a footnote that says our thanks to William J. Gallagher, news investigator at WJBK TV Detroit for sharing his extensive files on Ruther. So we're going to be getting into that as well, because this is something that uh, Michael Parenti actually talks about. So I am excited to talk about it. And let us go. And recent, actually, you know what? As I'm reading this, uh, I think the news just came out about Biden siding with the bosses instead of the workers for the railroad. And so as you're hearing this, I want you guys to think about the rail workers who might be going on strike soon too. So let, let's think about that, okay. In recent decades, organized labor has endured a serious battering from conservative interests in both government and the corporate world. As progressives in the AFL-CIO try to rally their forces, they would do well to remember those few especially dedicated and gifted union leaders who understood the broader social and political dimensions of the labor struggle. Among such leaders looms the great figure of Walter Ruther, rising from the ranks of, to spearhead the creation of the United Auto Workers, UAW, Ruther brought a special blend of unfaltering progressivism and efficacy to U.S. political scene. From this, he earned the wrath of powerful corporate and political interests. On the evening of May 9, 1970, Ruther, along with his wife, two close UAW associates, and the panel's two-man crew were killed when their charted Learjet crashed near the Emmett County Airport in northern Michigan. The brief flight had originated in Detroit and was coming in through the mist on an instrument landing when it plowed into the treetops and burst into flames. There were no survivors. A year and a half earlier in October 1968, Ruther and his brother Victor had barely escaped death in a remarkably similar incident while flying into Dulles Airport, again in a small private plane. On that night sky, what you see, on that night, the sky was clear for the pilots to realize that their altimeter was malfunctioning. And the, at the last moment, they managed to crash land the smashing of a wing into the plane, but no, but left no one seriously injured. 
Years later, Victor Ruther told us, quote, I and other family members were convinced that both the fatal crash and the near fatal one in 1968 were not accidental, end quote. Any number of highly placed persons may have wanted Walter Ruther out of the way. Indeed, as we shall see, there was evidence of foul play against him through much of his public life and evidence of sabotage relating to the fatal crash itself. So this is going to get deep, people. Deep, 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 deep. Okay. The early struggle. Eight months before his death, Ruther reflected on the broader dimensions of the labor struggle. Quote, the labor movement is about changing society. What good is a dollar hour more in wages if your neighborhood is burning down? What good is another week's vacation if the lake you used to go to where you've got a cottage is polluted and you can't swim in it and the kids can't play in it? What good is another hundred dollar pension if the world goes up in atomic smoke? End quote. Ruther was kind of a labor leader who unsettled the higher circles, militant, incorruptible, and dedicated both to the rank and file and a broad class agenda. The son of a German immigrant who was a lifelong socialist and labor organizer, Ruther devoted his life to the labor struggle. In 1932, after being fired from his job at a Ford plant because of unionizing efforts, he departed with his brother Victor on a three-year trip around the world. The itinerary included a prolonged stint as workers in a four plant in the Soviet Union. Writing to a friend back in the States, Victor described Soviet society in enthusiastic terms. The letter, which he signed, Vic and Wall, later was doctored in a number of places. Most notably, its closing comment, carry on the fight, was changed to carry on the fight for Soviet America, end quote. The FBI processed the original letter in its internal file, files, but cir I'm sorry, but circulated only the forged one to political leaders, corporate heads, and rival unionists in an attempt to show that the Ruthers were communist tools. Returning to Detroit in late 1935, Walter and Victor emerged as leaders in the often bloody struggle against their the automotive bosses winning landmark victories against Chrysler, GM, and Ford. In May of 1937, during a major leafletting effort, Ruther and dozens of other UAW organizers were brutally assaulted by Ford's thugs. Testifying at a federal hearing, Ruther described how he and his fellow organizers were repeatedly punched, kicked, and slammed against the concrete floor, then thrown down several flights of stairs, while the police stood by doing nothing. The police ain't there to protect you, baby. Like we said. Murder attempts. In April of 1938, two masked gunmen forced their way into Ruther's Detroit home during a party and attempted to abduct him. While they were trying to beat Ruther into submission, one guest managed to flee and summon help. The assailants were eventually arrested, but their trial proved to be a sham. Facing a jury packed with four sympathizers, the defense argued that Walter had staged the whole event as a publicity stunt. The state prosecutor conveniently neglected to mention that Ruther's organizing activities had made him a target at Ford and that both of the accused recently had been working for Ford's security chief, Harry Bennett. The jury acquitted them. No one could claim that the attack 10 years later was staged. On April 1948, Ruther was, now, was nearly killed by a shotgun blast fired through his kitchen window. He suffered chest and arm wounds and never recovered the full use of his right arm and hand. In 1949, an attempt on Victor Ruther's life suggests outright complicity by law enforcers. 
Victor began receiving calls from the Detroit police telling him that neighbors whom the police refused to name were complaining about his dog's barking. In fact, the dog had occasionally barked at night. When Victor went to see why, he would see a parked car started up and sped away. After the police issued a final warning, the family reluctantly gave their pet to some friends. The very next evening, Victor was shot in the head as he sat reading in his home. The bullet took out his right eye and parts of his jaw. A neighbor who volunteered a detailed description of the assailants to the police were never contacted for follow-up questioning and began receiving anonymous phone calls warning him to shut up. Footnote says, in December 1957, Ralph Winstead's body was recovered from Lake St. Clair. Winstead had been investigating the Ruther shootings for the United Auto Workers for eight years and, according to Victor, was the greatest source of worthwhile information on the case. His death was declared accidental and no investigation was made. Two days after Victor was shot, the U.S. Senate, in an unprecedented move, unanimously adopted a resolution requesting the FBI to investigate both attacks. U.S. Attorney, <clears throat> excuse me, U.S. Attorney General Tom Clark the governor of Michigan and the UAW itself also demanded an investigation. Although Attorney General Clark, so although Attorney General Clark, FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover's punitive superior pointed out that there were possible violations of the Fugitive Felon Act and several other federal statutes. Hoover refused to move claiming a lack of jurisdiction because no federal laws had been broken. Footnote. Clark Colt told UAW attorney Joseph Rowe, Edgar says no. He says he's not going to get involved every time some nigger woman got gets raped, end quote. Elizabeth Ruther, Dick Mayer, Ruther, a daughter strikes, page nine. Also, Hoover to Tolson, Ladd and Harbo, memorandum, May 26, 1949, FBI archives, 6195-56. On the demands for an investigation, see FBI archives, 6195-56, section four, passium. Back to the paragraph. Neither the FBI nor the Detroit police follow any of the leads uncovered by UAW investigators, nor did they come up with any of their own. No corporate officials were ever questioned. Forward strongman Harry Bennett, who had been implicated in the 1938 attempt against Walter, was never interrogated. In fact, Bennett was Hoover's golfing buddy and was considered a valuable ally who gave FBI access to his files on communist activity consisting mostly of dossiers on labor activists. At the end of 1949, an attempt to bomb UAW headquarters in Detroit was foiled by an anonymous call to, the, to a Detroit Times reporter. According to the caller, the explosive was quote unquote, plan when the big guy, Walter, was in the building, end quote. Needless to say, Investigations concluded, I'm sorry, investigations conducted by the police and the FBI led nowhere. On the national scene. By the 1950s, Ruther and the UAW had reached an uneasy modus vivendi with the two with the auto bosses. I'm sorry. According to Victor Ruther, the relationship was marked by an absence of rancor in the last years of Walter's life. Under Walter's leadership, the UAW not only grew into the largest union in the Western world with 1.2 million members, but became a powerful political organization. As we know today, the UAW is massive. By 1952, as president of both the UAW and the entire CIO, Ruthier had become, in the opinion of many, 
the most influential labor figure in the country. Ruthier used his position to promote pro progressive stances on a wide range of domestic and foreign policy issues. UAW locals around the country formed political action committees that lobbied lawmakers and helped elect candidates friendly to organized labor. At the same time, Walter and his brother Roy were building alliances between labor, church, and civic groups and ethnic minorities. Throughout the 60s, the UAW lent financial and moral support to the civil rights movement. Ruthier worked closely with Martin Luther King Jr., joining him in all the great civil rights marches and serving as a longtime member of the NAACP's board of directors, whose meetings the FBI routinely bugged. Y'all sipping y'all tea now? It's getting hot. Ruthier sparked the creation of the Citizens Board of Inquiry into hunger and malnutrition. The board's findings that millions of Americans were not getting enough to eat spurred Congress into enacting reforms. The UAW leader pioneered a, a variety of innovative programs, including employer-funded health and pension plans, cost of living allowances, and guaranteed annual wage. He fought for federally funded affordable housing, nationalized health care, government ownership of mono monopol monopolistic industries, worker participation in economic planning, and other proposals for redistributing power and wealth, all of which were taken as threats to the ruling class interest, as indeed they were. Under Walter and Victor's leadership, the UAW became one of the strongest proponents of the 1963 Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. I ooh, you know the, ooh, the neocons hated that. You know they did. UAW members marched in peace demonstrations and voted funds to support anti-war campaigns. Abroad, Ruthier was one of the USA's best known and best liked labor leader in a number of non-aligned countries. In India, he told an appreciative audience that US foreign policy in Asia placed an undue emphasis on military power and quote unquote, doubtful military allies to the neglect of quote, reliable democratic friends, end quote. By the 1950s, because of these kinds of activities, Ruthier had earned a number of powerful political enemies on the national scene. During the 1956 presidential campaign, Vice President Richard Nixon told Republican stalwarts that the UAW leader, not Democratic presidential candidate Adlai Stevenson, was, quote, the man to beat, end quote, because of his organizing power and big money. In 1958, at a GOP fundraiser, Senator Barry Goldwater declared that Walter Ruthier and the UAW CIO are more dangerous, are a more dangerous menace than anything Soviet Russia might do to America, end quote. Other members of Congress warned that Ruthier's dream of establishing socialist labor government in the United States. A two-page ad in the Wall Street Journal, September 22, 1958, ran an inch-high headline, Will you let Ruthier get away with it? The ad warned, quote, Walter Ruthier is already within reach of controlling your Congress. The American labor movement has now become a political movement with the objective of establishing a socialist labor government and control of the economic and social life of this nation, end quote. For his activities at home and abroad, as Victor recalled, quote, the right wing never lost his violent, bitter taste against Walter, end quote. Ooh, they hated that man. Hmm. Hoover's Vendetta. FBI Chief, Chief J. Edgar Hoover certainly never lost his violent, bitter taste. 
stalking Walter for some 40 years using undercover informants and illegal bugging equipment. Ruther was on friendly terms with several Democratic presidents who submitted his name for positions on presidential boards and commissions. In each instance, Hoover successfully blocked Ruther's appointment by secretly circulating disinformation packets to the White House and members of Congress featuring the doctor for Soviet America letter and testimony by individuals falsely accusing Walter of communist affiliations. Both the CIA and the FBI monitored Ruther's foreign travel, taking note of public comments of his that, quote, might be construed as contrary to the foreign policy of the United States, end quote. During World War II, Hoover made preparations to put all three Ruther brothers in custodial detention. He was ultimately dissuaded from doing so by John Bugas, chief FBI agent in Detroit. In his early Detroit days, Walter had formed an alliance with communists within the union that, I'm sorry, in order to combat conservative labor factions and company bosses. In 1938, he severed this association, and some years later, after gaining control of the UAW board, has launched a purge of dedicated UAW organizers who were communists or close to the party. In 1949, he played a key role in the expulsion of 11 unions accused of being communist-led. This goes to show how there are infiltrators and people who push people who would be comrades of ours to reject and deject those of us who are further left. So this is actually a really good point to think about. Um, like for instance, there are some people who want to unite with us who may be anarchists, right? Are we gonna simply reject them because you may have somebody who's anti-anarchist or anti-communist who says they're on the left, but they reject them. Because the thing is that they are also fighting with us in solidarity in order to achieve something better. And so unfortunately, Ruther, he kind of fell into that trap. Even though he was based on so many things, the problem is, is you know, a lot of times that propaganda, that brainwashing can even get to us and make us reject our you know, family on the left, our comrades on the left, because, you know, the government institutions, the bureaucracies, and the propaganda says that we need, we should reject them. So that's something to keep in mind as, you know, we continue to fight for true liberation. I think that's important. Over the years, Ruther denounced communism at every opportunity, seeking thereby to legitimate his own status as a loyal American. Like so many on the left then and now, he did not realize that those who fought for social change on behalf of the less privileged elements of society are poured by conservative elites, whether they be communists or not. Just to pause there for a second. The conservative elites also took over the Democratic Party. There's no difference between the Democrats and Republicans anymore. And so they're also going to do the same thing in the Democratic Party's Republican Party, so don't get it twisted. They do the exact same thing. Look, Joe Biden's a far right winger. If you look at his policies and the way he governs and operates, he is a far right winger. But people are blind to that fact and they will overlook it because there's a D next to his name or because he says he's for queer rights or for a woman's choice, you know, to choose what she does with her own body. 
But deep down, you know that's not true. You know he doesn't believe that. And people will say, well, people can, can change. He does it for political expediency. Same thing with Clinton. She did it for political expediency. You know? People, can people change? Yes. But that leopard ain't changing his spots. He won't even apologize for some of the missteps that he made in the past. That tells you where he's still at. Back to the paragraph. For the industrialists, financiers, and leading politicos, it made little difference whether their wealth and power was changed by communist subversives or loyal Americans. The communist label was used in attempts to smear and delegitimate Ruthier. But it was not an obsession with communism that caused them to hate and fear Ruthier, but an obsession with maintaining their privileged place in the political economic status quo. So it don't matter if you call yourself a communist, an anarchist, a socialist, a Marxist, a Leninist, a Trotskyist, a Maoist, it doesn't matter if you're continuing to fight for the liberation of the people against the interest of the oligarchs, against the ruling class, against the oppressor class within this nation, they are going to do whatever they can to stop you. It doesn't matter. You can call yourself a loyal American patriot. But if you're doing the same thing, the same fight that we're doing here on the left, that they are going to stop you at every single turn, even to the point of neutralizing you. That's how they operate. It's less about the label and it's more about the action. The funny part is they want you to focus on the label and less on the action when it comes to them. Black Lives Matter. While they're continuing to fund the police and let the police shoot, maim, and kill us with impunity. See how it goes? Beat the game. At the same time, Ruthier was critical of right-wing radicalism. In 1961, Attorney General Robert Kennedy asked him, Victor and Joseph Raw, an attorney for the UIW, to investigate the ultra-right. Ruthier was a close friend and advisor to the Kennedys. The resulting report warned of a radical right elements inside the military and urged the president to dismiss generals and admirals who engaged in rightist political activities. The report also faulted J. Edgar Hoover for exaggerating, quote, the domestic communist menace at every turn, end quote, thus contributing to, quote, the public's frame of mind upon which the radical right feeds, end quote. Though initially confidential, the report later became public. One can imagine the negative impact it had on Hoover and top circles in the Pentagon. Final break. From the first days in the AFL-CIO merger in 1955, irreconcilable political differences existed between Ruthier and AFL-CIO President George Meany, a Cold War hawk. Under Meany, the AFL-CIO entered into an unholy alliance with the CIA and in order to bolster conservative anti-communist unions in other countries. The unions, as Victor Ruthier describes them, were run by people who were, quote, well-soaked with the both U.S. corporate and CIA juices. It was, in effect, an exercise in trade union colonialism, end quote. In early 1968, the UAW withdrew from the AFL-CIO and joined forces with the Teamsters and two smaller unions to form the Alliance for Labor Action, ALA, 
with a membership totaling over four million. The Teamsters gave Ruther a free hand on the political and social issues. With Nixon in the White House and the bombings in Indochina escalating to unprecedented levels, Ruther ran ads in the national media and appeared before congressional committees to denounce the war and call for drastic cuts in the military budget. While the AFL-CIO was proclaiming its support for Nixon's escalation of the war and his anti-ballistic missiles program, the ALA was lobbying hard against both. Nixon's invasion of Cambodia and the killing of four students at Kent State University prompted, uni prompted Ruthier the day before his death to send a telegram to the White House condemning the war, the invasion, and, quote, the bankruptcy of our policy of force and violence in Vietnam, end quote. By 1970, Ruthier was seen more than ever as a threat to the dominant political agenda, earning her top place in Nixon's enemy list. The fatal crash, some disturbing evidence. The struggles of Walter Ruthier's life should cause us to, to give more than cursory attention to the questionable circumstances of his death. Here are some things to consider. First, as president of the largest union in the country, Ruthier had the resources for advancing his causes on the national scene, as did few others. He was an extremely effective proponent of socioeconomic equality and an outspoken critic of the military industrial complex, the arms race, the CIA, the national security state, and the Vietnam War. For those things, he earned the enmity of people in high places. Second, in the years before the fatal crash, there had been assassination attempts against Walter and Victor. Victor believes the attempts against him was intended as a message to Walter. In each of these instances, state and federal law enforcement agencies showed themselves at best lackadaisical in their investigative efforts, suggesting the possibility of official collusion or at least tolerance for the criminal deeds. In this context, it might be noted that in January 1970, only three months before the fatal plane crash, the Nixon White House requested Ruthier's FBI file. The call came from Igel Crow, a Nixon staff member who was later arrested as a Watergate burglar. The file documented Ruthier's leadership role in progressive and anti-war organizations. In 1985, when Detroit newsman William Gallagher asked why Nixon had wanted the file, Crow was evasive, claiming lack of memory. Third, like the suspicious near crash that occurred in the previous year, the fatal crash also involved a faulty altimeter and a small plane. It is remarkable coincidence that Ruthier would have been in two planes with the exact same malfunctioning in that brief time frame. Fourth, the investigation conducted by the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, of the fatal crash of May 1970 turned up some disturbing evidence, to say the least. When the investigations disassembled the captain's altimeter, they found no fewer than seven abnormalities. Most significantly, they discovered a brass screw lying loose in the instrument case. The report notes that with a loosened screw, quote, the altimeter would have read high by 225 to 250 feet. The screw, quote, locks the, um, locks the movable aluminum calibration arm in place when the instrument is calibrated. The threads within the screw hole were torn and ragged. Deposits of aluminum particles 
were observed on the threads of the screw. Examination of the x-rays revealed that the locking screw was in place prior to disassembly. Footnote says, National Transportation Safety Board, Aircraft Accident Report, Executive Jeff Jet Aviation Incorporate, Learjet L23A N434EJ, near the Emmett County Airport, Palestine, Michigan, May 9, 1970, adopted. December 22nd, 1970, report number NTSB AAR 71-3, Washington, D.C. All subsequent materials and quotations relating directly to the crash are from this report, unless otherwise indicated. Back to the paragraph. The report does not speculate as to who or what might have loosened the screw. Testing to see if the heat of the crash may have dis disassembled the screw Investigators placed a similar calibration arm mechanism in an oven and heated it for two hours at 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. The screw was found to be tight when examined. When the test screw was removed, aluminum deposits were found on its threads. The hole from which it was removed displayed torn and broken threads similar to those of the accident calibration arm suggesting the loose screw in Ruther's place had not been disassembled by the heat of the crash, but had been removed or loosened by deliberate human effort. Further, ex further examination revealed six other unusual defects in the altimeter. An incorrect pivot was installed in one end of a rocking shaft. An end stone was missing from the opposite end of the rocking shaft. A ring jewel within the mechanism was installed off center. A second rocking shaft was, I'm sorry, a second rocking shaft rear support pivot was incorrect. The wrong kind of link pin, which holds the spring clip in place at the pneumatic capsule, was installed. An end stone, which supports the shaft within the mechanism, was installed upside down. That these many abnormalities could accidentally and coincidentally appear in a single altimeter are close to impossible. With notable understatement, the investigators concluded that, quote, such conditions undoubtedly cause excessive friction in the altimeter mechanism. The board believes that while the evidence is not conclusive, the captain's altimeter was probably reading inaccurately, end quote. There were other problems. The pilot chose runway five, the only approach that was lit, but it lacked both runway and identifier lights and visual approach path indicator VAPI. The VAPI gives pilots their proper flight angle and helps them to determine whether they are too high or too low. The principal approach, runway 23, was equipped with VAPI, but one of the runway lights was out. Normally, pilots are given notification if a light is out on the main runway. This was not done, suggesting that perhaps the light had been broken close to landing time. Why did runway 5 lack identifier lights in a VAPI? Why was such a difficult... I'm sorry. Why was such a deficient approach the only one that was lit? Inviting the pilots to choose it. Why was the light on runway 23 not operating and why was no notice sent out? The NTSB report neither asks nor answers these questions. In its operating synopsis, the NTSB report emphasized the lack of visual cues as a cause of the accident. The body of the report, however, placed more emphasis on the faulty altimeter, noting that these, I'm sorry, that noting that in the absence of sufficient visual cues, use of the altimeter is a necessity. An altimeter which read too high could have caused the pilot mistakenly to think that he had sufficient altitude for a safe landing. 
In view of the condition of the captain's altimeter, such a situation is highly possible. Aside from the altimeter, the report found that no defects in the aircraft. The Lear jet was properly certified. I'm sorry. The Learjet was properly certificated and airworthy, and there was no malfunction of the aircraft prior to the accident. Nor was there evidence of crew incapacity or error. Previous medical records and post-mortem examination of the pilot and first officer did not reveal any disease or physical disability that would have affected their performance. Captain George Evans had logged more than 2,000 hours of flight time on Learjets and more than 140 hours in the previous three months. And both pilots have flown into Palestine Airport many times under far worse conditions. An Associated Press story carried out, I'm sorry, carried in the New York Times, July 16th, 1970, under the headline, No Sabotage Found in Ruth Air Crash, stated that the NTSB said today that it had found no indication of sabotage to explain the jet air taxi crash. The time story is seriously misleading. In fact, the NTSB reports utters not a word about sabotage one way or the other. It notes how numerous unusual defects in the altimeter may have caused a malfunction, but it says nothing about what caused the defects themselves, except to rule out heat as a factor in disassembling the locking screw. The report never questions whether the altimeter was tampered with, yet it proffers a good deal of evidence to suggest that it was. In effect, the investigators ignored their own findings, leaving it for the press to announce that there were no suspicious findings. Earlier on the day of the fatal crash, the same ill-fated Lear jet carrying popular singer and outspoken right-winger Glenn Campbell have flown into Detroit with no report of a faulty altimeter. Victor Ruthier noted that there was sufficient time between flights for tampering with the altimeter. He also pointed out that because they had so many clients and different pilots, rental planes are inspected with unusual care and frequency. The pilots demanded as much. In July 27, 1995 interview, a spokesperson for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association stated that civil aircraft used for commercial purposes undergo rigorous mandatory inspection programs. In some, it is inconceivable that an altimeter with seven defects would have gone undetected if properly inspected before the flight. Was there such an inspection? If so, by whom? If not, why not? The NTSB report never asks these questions. It makes no inquiry about when the altimeter had been last inspected. Victor Ruthier commented, quote, I was never convinced that there had been a thorough investigation by federal authorities. There have been too many direct attempts on Walter's life, and there was too much evidence of tampering with the rental plane, end quote. Footnote says that it was from a Victor Ruth Deer interview, January 30th, 1992. In a follow-up interview with us, Victor further noted, quote, animosity from government had been present for some time before the fatal crash. It was not only Walter's stand on Vietnam and Cambodia that angered Nixon, but also I had exposed some CIA elements inside labor and this was also associated with Walter. There's a fine line between the mob and the CIA. There's a lot of crossover. Throughout this entire history of labor relations, there is a sordid history of industry in league with Hoover and the mafia. You need to check into right-wing corporate groups and their links to the national security system, end quote. Hot tea, hot tea. Checking into such things is no easy task. The FBI still refuses to turn over nearly 200 pages of documents regarding Ruthier's death, including the copious correspondence between field offices and Hoover. And many of the released documents, some of them 40 years old, 
are totally inked out. It is hard to fathom what national security concern is involved or why the FBI and CIA still keep so many secrets about Walter Revere's life and death. Revere's demise appears as part of the uh, probably the truncation of liberal and radical leadership that included the deaths of four national figures. President John Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Senator Robert Kennedy, and dozens of leaders in the Black Panther Party and in various community organizations. While the Ruthier's death was part of a broader agenda to decapitate and demoralize the mass movements of that day, or whether such an agenda existed at all, are questions that go beyond the scope of our inquiry. Suffice it to say that Victor's belief shared by Walter's daughter, Elizabeth Ruthier Dick Mayer, and other members of the family, that the crash was no accident sounds disturbingly plausible. Despite the limited investigation, there's enough evidence to suggest that foul play was involved. The untimely death of this dedicated and effective progressive labor leader raises disquieting questions about the criminal nature of state power and in what purports to be a democracy. Ooh, wee. Mm, 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 mm. Dirty truths, dirty truths, dirty truths. Wasn't that deep? That was some deep stuff. I never heard of, of Walter Ruthier until I read this. Actually, let me... Let me do this. Let me look him up really quick. Uh, Walter, you there? All right. So, um, okay. Let's open image and new tab. Okay. All right. So let me share my screen just so you guys can know what he looks like. Um, before, so that you guys can get context. So this is Walter Ruthier. That's who he was. So yeah, this was a very popular and prolific labor organizer back then. And to say that his death was an assassination, allegedly, by certain alphabet institutions, But this is, he, he challenged power. That's basically what it was. He challenged power. And the corporate elites at the top did not like it. He was too powerful. And he was speaking to the needs of the proletariat. And so because he was speaking to the needs of the proletariat, then what did they do? They had to neutralize him. The amount of workers that are in unions has dwindled significantly. 89% of workers are no longer in a union. 89%. So nobody, almost nobody's in a union now. And so in pushing for nationalization of, you know, monopolistic 
uh, you know, entities, like for instance, nationalizing, like for instance, the fossil fuel industry or something like that, that is a huge red flag to these corporate overlords. Or nationalizing the healthcare industry. pushing for more worker power. That is a huge, massive threat. Answer this and put this in the comments if you would like. If Bernie Sanders fought as hard as Walter Ruthier did, do you think Bernie would still be alive? So I just want to thank you guys for tuning in to this reading. And the next time we meet, I'll be starting on page 209, uh, chapter four. Chapter four, political theory and consciousness. False consciousness, part one of chapter four. So political theory whoop, and consciousness. Talks about false consciousness. So we're going to be reading that. So I can't wait to get into that. That's going to be interesting. Interesting. I can't wait to get into it. It's going to be great. Also, uh, yeah. So be sure to, you know, tune in to part two of chapter two of my reading of Asada Shakur's autobiography. That's going to be good. And yeah. I cannot wait. So I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you so much for reading along with me. Reading is fundamental. So let's continue to do it and let's continue to educate our brothers, sisters, and siblings in, you know, learning more so that we can push more for the power that we deserve. So that the spirit of Black Panthers, the spirit of Eugene Debs, the spirit of Malcolm X, the spirit of Asada Shakur, the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr., the spirit of Walter Ruthier can continue on so that we have good things not just crumbs. Water your plants, water yourselves, leave the world better than you found it. Mwah. Forehead kisses for every single one of you. I'll see you next time.